The Batteries Included podcast is brought to you with United Chargers. United Chargers presents the Grizzly range of EV chargers. There's the original Grizzly Classic, a powerful, heavy-duty, portable EV charging station built to withstand the toughest conditions. The Grizzly Duo, a dual-port unit designed to charge two vehicles at the same time. The Grizzly Mini, a small, portable charging station built with an indoor-outdoor rated cast aluminium enclosure. And the Grizzly Smart, a revolutionary smart EV charger. All Grizzly chargers come with a convenient 24-foot cable and the ability to adjust the current from 16 amps all the way up to 40 amps. That's 9.6 kilowatts, plus the IP67 rated. Built in Canada with the highest quality materials, order yours now at unitedchargers.com. That's unitedchargers.com. Hello, welcome to the Batteries of Good Podcast. It's November the 24th, 2023, and this is episode number 12. Thank you very much for joining us, and we hope you're all enjoying a wonderful Thanksgiving weekend. On today's show, we'll be talking about Kyle driving the Audi SQ8 e-tron, Tesla imposing a congestion fee at superchargers, Ford cutting back on its LFP battery factory amid record sales, and of course, much, much more. I'm Dominic Yoni, host of the YouTube channel Drive Electric with Dominic. Joining us today is the jet setting, Mr. Tom Malogny, senior editor at Inside EVs and host of the YouTube channel State of Charge. And we also have the remarkable Mr. Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, <laughs> which is available on all the best podcast pat- platforms. And of course, Kyle Connor joins us from the majestic, practically palatial halls of Out of Spec Studios, where he produces high voltage videos for a number of YouTube channels. Hey there, everybody. Good to see you all. Good afternoon. So, guys. So, uh, Tom, uh, this, uh, we should probably address uh, your situation there right now. So, for the people who are watching us on YouTube or Twitch or Facebook they, or Twitter, they can see that you're somewhere in a different time zone than the rest of us. Well, we're all in different time zones. Uh, Martin Lee is in uh, the UK. I'm on the East Coast of the United States. Kyle is in the mountains of the United States, and you are. I am currently in the on the beautiful island of Koh Samui, Thailand, Ooh. on vacation. So this isn't a uh, media drive where I'm out, uh, you know, driving a vehicle. This is just R and R with the little lady having a blast here in Thailand. I was in Bangkok for a few days, and now we're over on the island of Koh Samui. Okay, and uh, I don't know. Let's, I'm, let's talk a little bit about uh, EVs over there. If you have a So you've seen some over there, I guess? Yeah, so on the island, I haven't seen any. um, But on the island, there's almost all like just motorbikes and scooters and stuff. There are some some trucks, which a surprisingly large amount of Ford Rangers. I'm like surprised that there'd be so many. I thought I'd see more like Toyotas and Mitsubishis and stuff like that. But there's a ton of Ford Rangers here um, uh, on the island. But uh, back in Bangkok, there's a lot of EVs in Bangkok and there's public charging stations and some of the hotels even had chargers. Um, there was a ton of uh, the auto threes, the BYD auto threes. They're everywhere. The yeah. cabs, the, they don't have Uber. I forget what it's called. Um, geez. I even, I even downloaded the app. It's like Uber ride or something. I forget what it is, but um, t- a ton of those people had them. Uh, there were also a lot of MG uh, EVs that were used for the car sharing, but the Auto Three by far is the most EVs uh, in in Bangkok. They were everywhere. Very distinctive headlights with like a light bar, so you could see them coming in advance. And, and uh, I couldn't believe how many of them there were. It was definitely. I mean, I saw Teslas and I saw uh, Hyundai's and I saw Mercedes electric. I mean, th- there was you know a sprinkling of all these other EVs, but BYD is dominating the show here with electric vehicles for sure. Mike, the car geek says Thailand hearts pickups, maybe more than America, which is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also, interesting. And it was funny that there, that there's like a Raptor trim for the Ford Ranger. Right. And, and um, I remember seeing like, like a truck drive by and I was like Raptor. I'm like, don't tell me they have a Raptor here, but it was a, a, a small like Ranger just decked out with like the Raptor writing on it. It wasn't, it wasn't a real Raptor. But uh, yeah, they they love pickup trucks. They're they're all over the place. Right, and and I guess you've been sampling the local cuisine. I understand. Yeah, for sure. I, I I'm not a very adventurous 
eater, which is surprising because I owned a restaurant for 30 years, right? right? But I'm I'm very boring. But I did something that I never thought I would do while I was here. I ate fried scorpion. <laughs> this is, this I just is the best did picture it ever. Really more than any reason to have that picture. I actually have a video of it, but I spared you guys of the video of me like chewing and crunching it. Um, I did that really because all my friends make fun of me because we go out to eat and like, I'll order the same thing all the time. I'm not adventurous. Meredith, my wife loves to try different food everywhere. So I was like, I'm going to eat like the most ridiculous thing while I'm here and just shut them up. So now, you know, whenever they're busting my chops about not being adventurous, I'm going to be like, well, did you eat a fried scorpion? I didn't think so. <laughs> so yeah, it, 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 I probably won't be going back for seconds. Right on. So is it like, it has a bad taste? I guess it's crunchy, right? It was really crunchy. I don't know if you're supposed to eat the claws. I, I tried to chew them, but they, they, they just were like, it was like chewing shells. And then when you get to the main body, it was, um, that was, <laughs> you know, had a little more substance going on inside, but it, 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 it really, it was, it had spice on it. So that more than anything, I tasted like the heat more than, flavor it really wasn't very flavorful <laughs> right well, well kyle looks like he's very jealous of your situation down there <laughs> <laughs> kyle are you up for some fried scorpion no <laughs> not not even not even remotely close to anything like that <laughs> all right okay i guess we should move on then but uh yeah that, that's pretty cool uh, interesting about the uh, the BYD Atos being all over uh, Bangkok, though, because uh, BYD really has a large international presence, and it's I, I think more than any other you know automaker with, with the EVs, they're pushing like their their international into different markets that you know yeah. nobody else is. And then you know, tons of advertisements here for their EVs. There okay. were advertisements for the Dolphin everywhere. It seemed like everywhere I drove, there were huge billboards for it. I mean. They, they, everywhere i couldn't drive five minutes without seeing a billboard for the for the dolphin so um you know they're, they're investing in marketing here heavily by right. oh yeah so uh, i have to apologize we don't have a uh a week uh daily evd ev news daily weekly roundup this week because martin here has been under the weather for like weeks now like we we, did, we filmed a, a battery bargains episode a couple of days ago, and I mean, I was surprised he was even out of bed. Like... <laughs> I got out of bed, I put my face on a uh, game face, and uh, and we did that, and, and then I went back into my hole for a day. Yeah, I uh, the the COVID tests keep saying negative, but um, it's uh, hey, it's absolutely textbook, and it's wiped me out. If I sit still <laughs> in one place, I, I'm fine. If I try and move around. Um, and this is what I'm telling my wife. If I try and tidy up after the children, clean the house, cook dinner, I can't manage any of that. So I just best sit down and <laughs> until I'm better. Um, it's probably sometime in the new year. I think it'll probably clear up. She's not having it. So uh, no, thank you for your uh, thank you for your patience last week when I, I literally couldn't make the show. Oh, um, that's true. And uh, and thank you for patience for my, for my podcast listeners who have had to uh, miss out on my voice, uh, which I think is actually a good thing. It's it's I'm sparing them, but. Um, Sadly, um, yeah, it's it's been a it's been a weird one, but there we go. All right, well, well hopefully that uh, gets a little bit better soon. We won't ask you too many questions today. Well, but uh, but speaking of that, so it's been a pretty quiet week, uh, product wise, product news wise, but we still got lots to talk about this Thanksgiving week. So uh, let's kick it off with Kyle, actually, because uh, who, along with his LA Auto Show crew, spent some quality time with the Audi SQ8 e-tron. And so we'd like to hear about that a little bit. So we've heard a fair amount about the original e-tron, which is now a, like a pretty good deal on the used market, as we've discovered, as well as the new Q8 e-tron, uh, as it has been renamed. So, but the SQ8 e-tron uh, is the performance version. So Kyle, it's got it's got more power than the regular e-tron Quattro, starting with uh, starting with the difference in the powertrain. Maybe tell us what you thought about the car and whether or not it's the e-tron to get. Um, well, maybe we should go back in time. So sure. I am an e-tron fan, but because they, they don't, so the e-tron thing is they look terrible on paper until you drive one and you're like, oh, this is really nice and comfortable and feels like a bank vault and is super high quality. And I own an e-tron. We have one. We have a, a first generation standard, uh, you know, big battery, but no e-tron S. 
In 2021, I think it was, Audi launched on the original e-tron platform, the e-tron S. And the e-tron S was same battery, but with the little wide fenders, which make it look incredible. These awesome wheels, big brakes, like all the things you would want and a tri-motor system. I actually think it launched before Model S Plaid or Model X Plaid launched. So I don't know if it was the first tri-motor mass production EV, but definitely from a German automaker. I think it's the first and really only at the moment. And so it was like a really unique thing. They, you know, Audi basically said, okay, we've designed this platform. We've designed this chassis. Let's do something special. And they put a three motor system in it. And I was blown away when I had the chance to drive this car in Italy on the rally roads, the original, like, you know, group B rally roads of Italy. And I'm like, full sideways in this e-tron with the three motor torque vectoring stuff i'm like this is so cool um and yeah it, it was never fast in a straight line but what really had the magic of that car was the crazy torque vectoring stuff and so okay i loved it had fun made a video and that was it it's not like the audi us guys they never put them in the review fleets there was never an opportunity to drive it in the us so i never drove one here i only drove one in europe in um the i'm trying to think now so now fast forward audi launched the q8 e-tron earlier this year which is the mid-cycle refresh of the car they've branded it as q8 rather than just e-tron to signify this is their their top level luxury offering in the electric space and they didn't really change much for the car on a styling perspective just a little bit different grill up front tiny little changes to the rear diffuser stuff like that but it had a 20 kilowatt hour larger battery pack usable uh and a little bit more efficient motors they claimed and some other things um we tested the q8 and the old e-tron back to back we put right. our car back to stock I took a Q8 e-tron, same exact tire, same exact wheel size. We ran them side by side. We did charge testing, range testing, 10% challenges. And we found that the new car was only better in the range portion, which it certainly does go farther on a charge. But once you stop to recharge, they actually almost match each other. And uh, there was almost no difference after that that one initial leg. Once you start getting to the point where you have to charge to go, um, there, there was almost no difference. So, you know, when you look at used versus new in the luxury car space, it's not uncommon for a previous model to depreciate heavily. Um, I don't know if there's a better example of what's going on with the e-tron right now, which is the previous model almost matches everything the new one can do, except for that initial big range it's even more efficient the old one we tested side by side even though audi claims the new one's more efficient not in, not in our testing it's i guess near as makes no difference we can say um it's a pretty amazing that the old one for thirty thousand dollars has gives you the same experience as the new one which in the luxury car space usually that's like the previous model or a pre you know major change and so here it's like okay no reason to buy a new one just buy a used one and you know stop at a charger one extra time and put sixty thousand dollars in your pocket that seems like a reasonable trade-off the sq8 uh basically builds on the q8 platform it's got that bigger 106 kilowatt hour battery pack but there are no adaptations to the drivetrain system from last year so it is uh just the same 496 horsepower something like that just under 500 yeah, horsepower 496 uh -huh. yep and it has a 250 mile epa range if you get the really ugly aero wheels which we're not going to let any of our viewers ever get we'll block them if they get those wheels you have to get the big 22 inch wheels which look incredible but bump your range all the way down so that's the combustion one there on the screen um apology sorry sorry it's okay um, but you have to get the big wheels, but it bumps your EPA range down to 218 miles or 216 miles, which is what our car gets. <laughs> and so it's just crazy inefficient. You know, Audi learned about the word efficiency and just ignored it, uh, basically. But maybe there isn't a but. This thing, well, there goes the balloons. Uh, this is a, <laughs> the one that I tested was $103,000. So it's 103 grand. It has less than 500 horsepower, which a Model X Plaid starts at 90 and has 1,020 horsepower. 
I mean, mm-hmm. literally more than double for less money. I mean, we're not even in the same ballpark and three, you know, all these things, but Ooh. okay. There's a big, but here, the, but is this car sucks on paper. Okay. We know that the e-trons okay. always sucked on paper. Okay. But there is a very few, very, very small audience for this vehicle that will love it. And it is a very niche car. They're not going to be bringing many into the U.S. because I think Audi realizes it. But if I was picking an electric SUV, this is the one my heart wants. Because even though you don't get the outright acceleration, the handling, the tri-motor control, the way it does the torque vectoring, the way the brake pedal feels, the bank vaultness of the chassis, the sound system rips, the way that this package comes together is incredible. Um, so then it comes to the question of, what are you gaining over the previous SQ, e-tron S to the SQ8? And mm-hmm. the answer is 20 kilowatt hours. I think the other one was rated for like 170 something miles EPA for also close to a hundred thousand dollar car. Um, so you're really, you know, you're getting some more range here, but uh, it looks amazing. Drives great. Fantastic drivetrain. No one will buy it because on paper, it's the worst value ever. Maybe if they do a good lease deal on them, But again, there's going to be those people like me that will say, I'm going to spend up the money for the great driving dynamics, for the unique look on the road. When you see one of these, you know it's an enthusiast who went out of their way, who said, I don't care about the outright power. I don't care about the range. I want the driving dynamics and that Audi feel. And that's what you get. And there is nothing on the market that comes close to it in that department uh, right now. Really looking forward to trying Lucid Gravity. Uh, Mm Because I think that might uh, be a contender for sure. And it's going to blow away the range and efficiency numbers. But uh, I I think Audi did too little to to, to do, you know, reasonably charge one hundred and three to one hundred and five thousand dollars for a fully spec one. They start at 90 something, but you're going to spec it up to 100 anyway. So it's beautiful. I I love the way it looks. Those roof rails with the wide fenders, those wheels. But wow, what a bad value. So I can't recommend this car to anyone except people that are like me that are dumb who love driving dynamic stuff and not anything else. So how would you compare it? Like the driving, driving dynamics to, of the, uh, the squate, can I call it the squate SQ8? Yeah. The squate. Yeah. <laughs> how does it compare to the BMW iX? Totally different character. Right. The, the iX is very stable. It's mm-hmm. very, uh, you know, almost German in the way that it goes about its things. You sit on the highway at top speed in the iX and you're locked in. And this should provide a pretty similar stable feel. The iX, no question, is a next generation product uh, to, to this old e-tron, just from a chassis perspective and efficiency and acceleration. I mean, I would only recommend an iX over an e-tron. But for me, um, in the in that canyon driving experience which i'm lucky enough to be able to do quite a bit because i live here in the mountains um well this is more fun this has this like sort of lively character it's like someone gave a german way too much beer and they said go make something crazy in an suv and they did and it's it's wild you can hang the tail out if you want to it's extremely fun in the corners i just love the size of the e-tron i love the look of this car has 80 amp onboard charging, which you're going to need because I think in my test drive, I averaged like 1.1 miles per kilowatt hour. I mean, granted, we were driving it hard in the mountains, but like not that hard. We were still on public roads. And I was like, how is it this inefficient? That's that's my real big question. Like, how is it that inefficient? I don't know. I really (laughs) don't know where they make the electricity go in this car. So Kyle, you're going to pick one up in 2026 for 45 grand. It'll probably be less than that, Tom. I think, I think there'll be less than 45 grand, but yes, that's the move uh, is, you know, I mean, of course with any luxury car, they're going to depreciate, right? So we can't just always say, wait for a used one, but you either lease this thing or you buy it new knowing, Hey, I'm going to keep it for a while. It is going to depreciate, but it's a really cool car. And, and ultimately this car will work for, a lot of people, especially in California, especially in Colorado, that may just stick to mountain driving or live in the hills and don't really go on road trips. This is the correct choice if you're that type of buyer because it is just so good in the corners. And, until the Porsche Macan comes out. Yeah, that's going to be quite a bit smaller. Oh, is uh, it? Okay. Yeah. So, okay. but yes. Yeah, I saw the Audi actually calls it the uh, e-tron an SQ8 e-tron a, a mid-size SUV, which I always thought it was a bit larger than that, but I don't know. 
Um, the the only thing I should mention that that one point one mile per kilowatt hour number I gave out that's not like a range test number or anything. That was right. us being idiots with all four of us driving the car, being like, who can slide it more? <laughs> you know, so face it, don't don't base that number off anything else. Right on. Uh, so anything else we need to know about the SQA e-tron? Um, if you buy one, you're instantly my best friend. It's really cool, but I can't recommend it because logically this makes no sense. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's move on, I guess. So Kyle, the LA auto show was last week and you put out a huge two hour video taking us through pretty much the entire thing. So first, thanks for that. Uh, it's always great to get your on the ground view of the show. Uh, not everybody can get out there and just there's something about walking and doing like the walkthroughs like that. It's a little different from like seeing like a, like a 30 second video, you know, focus on one particular booth. You don't really get a sense of what's going on around everything. And it's kind of nice to have that. So I, you know, I really appreciate your videos, those walkthroughs. So Thank we, you. we talked, we, we talked about the lucid gravity debut last week, but was there, was there something else there that we, you, you think didn't get uh, the detention, the attention it deserved? It was a pretty slow show. Um, you can now buy a Hyundai through Amazon. Right. Uh, I did a sound <laughs> system demonstration of the Bang & Olufsen in the uh, Acura ZDX. Okay. And so that was cool to talk to the some sound engineers about that system. And just okay. general sound systems and how we should approach reviewing them. So that was a good educational one-hour deep dive into you know how, how should we review a sound system, especially as we can't replicate... Um, you know, the, the sound to our audience by microphone transfer to YouTube compression, mm -hmm. and then their, their speakers ultimately. So how do we articulate a sound system in a car? We learned a little bit more about that, which was very useful. Ionic 5N was on display. I still have a full video coming on that car tour. Really excited for that one in particular. Um, yeah, there was, there was not, not much going, not much going right. on. Did you have something in mind? Uh, no, no, I, I didn't make it through the whole video yet. Uh, that's how my, still on my list of things to watch but uh, so how will how will the amazon selling hyundai's thing work then we don't know okay so will they uh just <laughs> will will they just do it as a fixed price uh so apparently yes and it will be sold through a dealer local to you and the, the problem is a lot of hyundai dealers right now are saying we have all of these cars on our lot but like half of them are in transit and right. so it's gonna be quite a logistical thing and i think you have to be a dealer that signs up for the program and and I, it sounds like they don't deliver it to your house which like i just want to see this thing on a trailer behind yeah. a rivian mm -hmm. you know edv being dropped off but i don't know it, it, it i'm not sure if that's going to work or not but we'll see it could work i mean it, yeah, it could totally. work if they got it right like you say if they just if you order a car uh, uh, on your phone when you're at work and you get home with prime and it's there the next day and you just sign the paperwork or they'll have a little iPad and you just scribble your name and then off they go and you've got a brand new car. Um, that would be cool. Um, and it would affect the dealership model again because Amazon's just convenient, whether you like them or not. I see both sides. Yeah, of that, I, but... I think uh, anything to reduce the hassle of dealing with 90% of Hyundai dealers is a great situation. So I am all for this. We learned through the pandemic how many of them were charging way over sticker not understanding their product there were some great ones out there uh this gary rome hyundai comes to mind because that's where my dad got his ionic 5 they were great they had like dc charging they like knew the cars pretty well like that was awesome but then uh, i went to my local dealer here and they're like what, what, we're not going to talk to you or anything because we don't know like what about this combustion car and i'm like that's yeah. not the answer uh so that's it, interesting anything to remove that's great if we get time today, I'll talk about me selling my car. And I got a friend who uh, is a um, who who sells used cars. Um, he has a beautiful showroom, um, and my car is by far the worst thing in his his showroom amongst b uh, beautiful Tycons and. Um, well, let's and talk. Let's talk about your car right Teslas. now, then. Um, and he and okay, we can. And and he was saying uh, that uh, nine times out of ten since COVID, um, people don't look at cars anymore. So some a quality place like his, um, he said, I have to make sure the cars are prepared perfectly like there can't be any little scuffs or paint chips or whatever um and he makes sure and, and if the, the the wheels aren't right he's got a guy that refurbs the wheels the alloys um and it's got to be right because people's got people will look at it online and once they've made the journey to go and get if they've bought it online and it's not right well of course they can reject it and then they've made a wasted journey he says but he's built his business on on a lot of repeat customers as well 
And he said the amount of people that will buy online now if they trust where they're buying it from, and they're just too busy. I, I, they, they don't want to go walk, kick, kick tires for a day. They just want to go buy it and go get it or, ha or have it delivered. He, he delivers them as well. Um, and I thought that's really interesting. Nearly nobody that he deals with, and okay, he's not selling bangers, but um, will go look at a car, wow. which I, I thought was interesting. Hmm. Uh, that should be interesting. Uh, we hopefully, I don't know if we can, but we're going to try to ask him see if he can get on on the battery bargain since he deals with car, he sells cars and knows all the cars. He's like the great person to like oh recommend a car for whatever situation. So we're kind of yeah. looking forward to that. Well, you guys know you you guys know Richard. He lives about twenty minutes away from me. He's been selling Teslas forever, but then he sort of expanded out and um, uh, he came over. He actually flew over when Kyle, when you put on your um, test drive day almost two years ago now, and you got all the car makers together and you got all the vehicles that nobody had driven yet in one place. He he flew out to the states to do that, um, and he couldn't wait to meet you. And um, he's got a great YouTube channel as well. Um, so you guys know him. He's a legend. Um, so yeah, he he sells half decent cars, um, and then he he said, "Oh, I'll." I'll list yours for you. Uh, so he, um, where is it? Oh, here it is. In, in amongst the Teslas and the uh, and oh, the Taycans and, and all that kind of stuff. And wow. so yeah, Mike, it's never looked so good. Tell me about it. It's and it genuinely never has looked so good because there there's there was a couple of things on it where somebody had walked past in a car park or a supermarket car park with I don't know their coat zips and stuff and just done some minor scratches on it. You know, not one that you could put your nail in. Um, yeah. But enough that when it was clean, you'd see it. And he's like, no, that's got to be fixed. It's got to be perfect. It's got to mm -hmm. feel like, a, to the person that has this, an 18,000-mile, two-year-old car, um, it's got to feel like a new car. And it's got to be right. And, and he said, you've got to spend this and this and this and get it done. And it's got to be perfect. Otherwise, they'll they'll not accept it, and they've wasted a journey. And he'll that damages his business. So, um, so yeah, he's got a great place. He's got somewhere to photograph them, as you can see. Yeah. Um, and, um, and boy, oh, boy, someone's going to get themselves an absolute freaking bargain so uh i i'm buying and selling at the absolute worst time on this um uh, on my kona because uh, i bought this a year ago kona ultimate specs i think your specs are called something different but we're, here it's called the ultimate spec so the, the top trim heated cooled seats all of the lane keep and hda and all that kind of stuff and um uh, i bought that for 34 last this time last year 12 months ago uh 34 000 pounds and it had done 4,000 miles. So it was below, a, a fair amount below mileage. That was one year old. Um, the car is now two years old. And um, I've put 10 and a bit thousand miles on it in a year. You guys know I don't do too much driving. And um, uh, and it's time to it's time to shuffle it on because we've adopted our little baby girl. And, you know, as mums and dads know, the smaller the kids, the bigger the crud that you have to carry with them. And that's the only thing. So if someone was looking at this and thinking, oh, I've got, you know, I've got two babies, I don't buy a Kona. Um, oh, pl please buy my car. But no, please don't. Don't buy this car because uh, it's, it's just, <laughs> it's not, it's just, it's the, 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 the boot is just too small. Um, and I, and that's, it's the biggest thing they've changed in the new third gen Kona. And if you haven't seen one of those yet, um, uh, my friend uh, Nick, Evie Nick, I've done a great review video comparing this one and the new Kona. Go check out his channel on YouTube. And um, the biggest thing is the is the is the is the, the cargo space so much bigger, and they've really fixed the Kona. Um, but otherwise, yeah. So fair market value, not even the cheapest Kona on Auto Trader. Fair market value for this twenty two thousand. Mm. So I've taken a twelve thousand pound hit. It's cost me a thousand pounds a month, even before insurance and running costs wow. in depreciation on. A, a small, a compact uh, family car. Um, no wonder I'm ill. Uh, right. My God, I'm, I'm coping with that. So, um, I mean, it, I has, <clears throat> it stings. It really stings. Um, but yeah, actually, I must sign out because there's a picture of my little boy on there, <laughs> which is he's, he's he's my profile picture. Uh, <laughs> I must I must get Richard to sign out of my Blue Link account. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, like the Blue Link stuff on the Kona is pretty good, and. Um, uh it you know it's uh you know it's not a tesla app but even then this does, does stuff like that won't do like all the trip data and all the analysis and what have you so yeah the kona ultimate spec is brilliant had this fitted as well because that's the one thing that you need i think is if you're driving around and someone's an idiot um is it dash cam yeah you want front and you want front and rear facing dash cam if you can but obviously all properly installed because i don't like the little ones that you just you know get off amazon and stick on um so we'll all properly plumbed in um, with uh, you know, with the electrics and stuff, just because I think you, you, if you're not driving a Tesla and you haven't got all those cameras, you just need it these days to avoid an argument with someone if they're stupid. Um, so, so. 
But yeah, so you, and you know what? I'm going to miss the range on this. Like, we all talked about it, Guy. And actually, Tom, I know you you looked at a Kona, but you ruled it out on cargo space, didn't you? <clears throat> exactly. Just... When Before I bought my uh, 2019 uh, Model 3, I had my heart set on the Kona. And uh, until I really went and took one for a good drive and realized the back seating area just was not going to be big enough for me to haul my parents around. Um, and that combined, even even with that, I was thinking about doing it, but then and, uh, I just couldn't get a hold of them at the dealerships. None of the local dealerships had them. Um, you know, Hyundai wasn't uh, being really very forthcoming with when they were going to start shipping them to the East Coast. I waited a couple of months, and then I said, you know, why should I hold out and wait and wait and like almost beg uh, Hyundai for uh, to start shipping cars to the Northeast? When you've got Tesla, you know, kind of leading the charge here and, and doing everything they can to help uh, bring on EV adoption. This is going back 2019, I think, before, you know, Elon became real Elon. Uh, I really wanted to support the company. And uh, I, uh, you know, I said, you know what, I'm going to put my money over there because Hyundai seems like they're slow walking electrification. Now, since then, they've done a lot. Um, but but it was very frustrating that, that this really cool car was out. And they were kind of deciding what states were going to get it. And uh, they announced it was coming to New Jersey. Then it was like three months later. It still wasn't here in New Jersey. So I just, I gave up on them and said, I, I, I'll get the Tesla. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. So um, uh, in the comments here, we someone saying, same as me. Um, Cord says, I want to see a new car or drive it or a different one to compare it. Yeah, I'd have thought that's a, a common experience. I know a lot of people use videos like the ones Kyle and tom make and and use that for consumer research then make their decision and and purchase but um i guess i'm kind of old-fashioned i want to drive them but also i hate you know i hate being hassled and, and 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 feeling like i'm getting done out of a deal or something so um i understand why the direct sales thing works really well and lots of people do it so if you're going to sell your kona on do you have you decided what you're going to replace it with well if only only if only we had a spin-off show that happens every monday or tuesday called battery bargains that our viewers could help me choose my next car if only Maybe we, we should that. do that Maybe we should do that. Um, I asked, by the way, I asked Richard, I said, what should I get? And he said, you do a podcast about electric vehicles and you've never full-time owned a Tesla. You've got to just have one for a year. And Carl says it as well. Um, have one for a year, get it, and then just and then you can tick it. Uh, he said, so you should do that, but you should buy. And he said, you should buy an e-tron. Really? Yes, that's what okay. he said. I said, look, I've got two small people that mush yogurt into the back seat if, you, if, they, if you're not watching them. And he said, well, yes, it's got nice leather in the back and that might break your heart a little bit. And, and the, um, you know, the, the Tesla seats will wipe off fine and it's robust and it's just a working vehicle. He said, so get, go get yourself, um, you know, a year old standard range or long range with the new big 79 kilowatt hour pack or, or whatever. But uh, he said, but if I were you on a budget of 30, uh, which is my new budget, by the way, mm -hmm. um, he said, uh, go buy a used e-tron. That's two, that's two years old. He says, you get an e-tron for 30 grand and, and, and you'll feel like he said, the phrase was, you'll feel like a king. And I'm like, my friend, you sell used cars for a living because you've sold it to me. Um, but it's true. I, I think he sold it to me too, actually. <laughs> you, will <feel laughs> Just like a, you will feel like a king driving the e-tron. Um, so I don't know what to get next. But yeah, maybe the viewers can chip in and help me out. Um, two small people, rarely road trip. I don't care about doing 300 miles without stopping. I need to stop every hour and a half anyway. Um, and so... Uh, and, I, and I've never and I've never full time owned a Tesla. I've only mm -hmm. ever had them on loan and, and for review cars and, and what have you. So, yeah, maybe I, maybe I should do that for a year. Or six it's months. kind of it's kind of important for you. I, I think like Kyle also often says, you know, journalists in this space, they have to, you know, at least drive. One. I was reading something the other day, this this uh, automotive journalist who, you know, I don't know how where they've been for they've been, you know, writing and been a journalist for many years and just. A couple of weeks ago, I drove a Tesla for the first time. It's like, how how is this possible? You know, especially you know, it's a very high profile person. I'm not going to say any names or anything, but I was just kind of taken aback. It's like, I don't know. No. People, I didn't... Are people are suggesting things already. David says, "What about an iPace?" I don't want to get Ooh. into it now because it becomes battery bargains. Right, uh, right. We'll, we'll, we'll do the whole show. Um, yeah. But yeah, that that exactly. You're thinking the right. You're on the right lines. Thirty grand, couple of years old. Uh, exceptional value because EV values have fallen off a cliff here. So, Barton, Similar the the new Kona, the twenty twenty four with the yeah. third refresh design, yeah, that charges. I just saw Bjorn's video charges at hundred kilowatts now. What? That's better. 
Yeah. Much better. Yeah, yeah. It's significantly faster than the last one, but still can't match the BYD battery Model Y, which just mm. like rips charging to 100. That's the really? one. If you're going to get a Tesla, I think you just, just get a BYD battery Model Y um, because it's slightly less capacity than the CATL one. However, um, the charging performance is insane. It sits at 170 kilowatts to like 50%, and it's still doing like 35 kilowatts at 99. Like it just wow. rips what's the, to 100. What, what's the deal with your friend Brandon Flash, uh, who I, I keep seeing like bits, like snippets of him saying, oh man, the charge curve on my new Tesla. Is that a three or a Y? And he's really complaining about the charge curve. I think that's 4680 cells he's got though. What's the latest on him? Yeah, well, and and all of those 4680 Model Ys, which they didn't build that many of relatively because uh, mm -hmm. they're now not in production anymore. Uh, so all of the uh, 4680 Model Ys had really poor charging. They would peak and then just die. And uh, it's a really bad charging vehicle. And I've seen some battery chemists say maybe not possible to get better through software with sort of the Gen 1 4680 cell because there's some air gaps and some other things to do with cathodes and anodes and spacing. And I don't really fully understand it as much as I should, but basically it sounds like the 4680 battery packs in the model Ys, uh, that's the one to avoid. Don't buy those. Right. If you do a lot of high mileage and fast charging on the other hand, his degradation seems to be at zero and he has just beat the crap out of that battery. So, okay. Wow. So there's always trade-offs. And, and also fit and finish on, on those, uh, Austin, Model Y is supposed to be much better as well, I believe. Yeah, I don't think they build. Do they build Model Y in Austin still with Cybertruck coming? I mean, I think they were. Yeah, I think they've I stopped. Long now. Range. I think, I think they now stopped. they do. Okay. Just long I, range, I, maybe not. Uh, right off the top of my head, yeah, I can't, I'll be there. I can't speak for sure. I'll be there on Wednesday, so I'll, I'm going to see what what's going on there. I can't right wait to watch that coverage. That's going to be amazing. Yeah, should be yeah, fun. Because everyone oh, just wow. talks about Cybertruck right now, so it's really hard to get any other information. It's just all Cybertruck all the time, basically. Uh, for good, for good reason. So, yeah. um, so are you, what's your content around Cybertruck, Kyle? Can you do anything live there? Do you have to then watch it and then come out of the area to make stuff? What are you allowed to do at Cybertruck launch? Oh. Uh, you think Tesla lets us know things ahead of time? <laughs> oh, that's a good shout. That's yeah. a good shout. No. Yeah, it's I have no idea. Really, no idea what to expect. Uh, Colton and I are going to fly over just for the day, see what's going on, and then come back. Uh, there's, there's one of the Tesla in kind of influencers who I don't, I don't tend to follow the hardcore on both sides of the argument, like the people who want to see the company go down in flames, and also the ones that think Elon is God. Try and I try and stay down the middle. But there was one of those guys who is like a super, super, super fan, and at one of the most recent events, he got to the front of the line, and they're like no uh we've uninvited right. you go home and he talked his way in somehow eventually but he was like live streaming in tears being like i've been kicked out and i'm the biggest fan and then i think some calls were made and they let him in but i saw that and i'm like yeah they're pretty much a law unto themselves so as long as you get in and um we can't wait to hear next week how cybertruck launch went that's going to be so cool I, yeah I, I think that was ryan from the kilowatts oh, was, oh I think it was no Galley. was that ryan oh i feel bad i know now. ryan got rejected he had an invitation and when he showed up that last event like they're like yeah we know you have an invitation but it's been revoked no I, and he was just like i feel bad because ryan's one of the good guys or maybe it was maybe yeah. I, I i maybe i'm misremembering and if, yeah. if i'm misremembering then ryan i apologize because you, you are, you are I, definitely I one of you are one of the got, good guys out revoked. there he showed up with an image or, or he was <clears throat> no i think it was he was the plus one there was somebody got invited uh, and, and okay. they were allowed to take someone and they were taking him. Uh, it wasn't him. And then, when yeah. they, when he came to do it, they're like, no, 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 no. You're not, you're not, you're not allowed. You're not allowed to be a plus one. So. All oh, right. No, it but, wasn't uh, him then. It was, it was you somebody might be thinking else, of something else. It must be somebody else who was like one of the sort of the, the guys that retweets Twitter news all the time. Um, And I'm like, oh man, like they, yeah, like these, these events are just crazy, but wow. I can't wait to, it's, it's a huge, a huge amount of interest that I, I, I don't know. I, uh, we've seen the bit. We've seen the build quality on those cyber trucks at, at various things, and they've just got to. They've got to get it right. No, well, now they've got them in showrooms. There's a bunch of showrooms around the country. They've put examples of, and there was like there was a a couple weeks ago. Uh, Franz von Holzen, the uh, Tesla designer, showed up at a Carson Coffee in a cyber truck, and it was like terrible. The build quality, there was, everything was nothing was flush. You know, all the lines, and it made a big splash and all those sites were carrying you know 
pictures of all these, you know, mismatched, whatever. Uh, but the ones that they've sent out to showrooms, the show, show and showrooms are all like dead spot on. Everything, all the, you know, cut lines are all lined up. Uh, there's no big issues with, uh, yeah, this is the uh, the one that Franz had. You can see it's like not great looking. It's fit fit and finish going on there on the just on the body panels but yeah this was a uh, writer daniel golson um and they commissioned him to write a piece and uh, this is our old our old stomping ground and um and these guys got him in to write a piece and and he he took these pictures and yeah they weren't great so it's gonna be oh man that wet wiper is crazy <laughs> that's just <Right>. insane <laughs> i love it i love it the whole the whole vehicle's crazy the big question is who's gonna win the free grizzle e charger that I'm giving away to the person who guessed the correct amount of cyber trucks that get delivered to customers this year. We're finally going to have a winner. If you remember, I did it last year, but mm -hmm. none were delivered. Right. Um, so now we redid that and uh, you can't, it was on a tweet that I sent out or an X. Are they still called tweets by the way? Anyway, um, the uh, uh, you had to, you had to make your, Yes, back in January of, of this year. You can't jump in late now. But uh, it's so funny. For the second year in a row, I had some people posting like, there's no way it's going to be less than forty to 50,000 trucks. And I'm just like, are, are you living in reality? And they're like, oh, don't bet against Elon. And I'm like, he, he already said it's not coming out till the, the last quarter of the year. Right. You can't make that many vehicles in 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 in, a, in three months, but uh, you know I'm I'm still thinking it's going to be somewhere around a hundred ish. Um, you know we'll see. I know they're going to deliver. I think ten at this at this uh, handover cer ceremony. I think it was ten. So um, yeah, that was my uh, was that the one from this year or the year before? I wonder. Oh, that they... uh, oh no, that's yeah, the that's right the, one. Yeah, that's, that, that's from this year, December thirtieth, twenty twenty two. So yeah, yeah. You, you see there, you know, uh, the the most people voted for more than 5,000. You know, I guess people had a lot of faith in Tesla, but it's definitely going to be somewhere in that first one to a thousand, uh, you know, and we'll, we'll see. I have to I have to scroll through all the guesses, write everybody down, log everybody's guess. And then uh, the winner is going to get a uh, Grizzle E Charger, the sponsor of uh, our uh, uh, Batteries Included podcast. Uh, Maki Vlog is just asking. My biggest cyber truck question is how does it handle f fingerprints? I think probably like your fridge. Badly. I, I, see, I see the cyber truck is like a one big mobile refrigerator, basically. So, yeah, it looks, I don't know, it looks like it might not handle the, well, that well, but maybe we'll be surprised. Maybe there's some coding they can put on it to, I don't know, magic yeah, fingerprint don't coding. Know. But I don't know. I think you're going to see fingerprints like, you know, like the DeLorean. But right. uh, I don't think I, people care. You know, I guess I we'll be most people don't care about that. And a lot of people are going to wrap them. I think. I think you're going to see a ton of them wrapped. You know, you see regular Tesla's wrapped all the time now. So, right. Okay. Uh, and one of our viewers, Joseph, went to see one in Charlotte on Tuesday, and he has pictures. And we asked him what, what he thought, and he says. Uh, it looked pretty good. The back plastic was a little wavy, so not perfect for sure then. But yeah, I mean, I think it looks pretty impressive. I haven't seen one in person, but from what I, you know, reading all diff different accounts, and it looks, it seems like it's very impressive in, in person. It makes quite an impact. So I guess we'll we'll talk about the Cybertruck a lot next week, since it'll be a post uh, delivery event, and Kyle will have seen it. And uh, who knows, maybe you go for a ride in the Cybertruck. Usually they do like ride-alongs, right, at these events. Yeah, I'm not expecting anything. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's talk a bit more about uh, Kyle. While you're in Southern California uh, for this LA Auto Show, I believe you picked up a new car, the cheapest running EV in all the land, again. And I, so at least it was the cheapest at the time of purchase. So you have a great video of you going out and checking it out, and people should go watch that video. And maybe, but maybe uh, tell us what you paid for and a bit about your car and your plans for it, because it's, it's an interesting. Interesting car. Yeah, I paid uh, $2,999 for a Mercedes electric B class, which is a steal uh, because these things are going for 10 to 15, to even $17,000 on the used market. And for everyone who wants the full story, there's a episode today on the out of spec podcast 
full 20 minute episode walking you through the whole thing. So I won't dive on it too much into this show, uh, but ultimately, um, yeah, very thrilled with the uh, B class. It uh, charges actually. So the onboard charger is not the problem, uh, which okay. is what, what it was sold to me with a broken onboard charger. That's not the issue. So uh, it's at QC charge, getting some other issues diagnosed to figure out what's going on with it. Cause it's got a lot of issues. Uh, and uh, we're going to get those all sorted and bring it back here to Colorado. I've got studded winter tires for it already uh, waiting in the garage, which is great because we're getting dumped on with snow as we speak. And uh, yeah, just, just can't wait to drive this thing and make the videos with it. Should be really fun. Uh, these things are pretty cool. So uh, for people who don't know, this has actually a Tesla battery and motors in it, powertrain basically. Yes. Right. And uh, it also doesn't DC fast charge, which I That's thought correct. was very, very interesting. It's all J1772, baby. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we're, we're limited to AC charging. QC charge does have a DC fast charging retrofit really? uh, where they put a Chatamo port on the vehicle and then you can Chatamo it. But I said, ah, until you get NAX. I don't want that. So, right. uh, you know, I said, make, make your next port and then I'll, I'll pay to bring the, the B class back to California and you can swap that thing on there. Right on. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, also this week, you took delivery of some big time EV diagnostic tools. Again, you have a video coming out or you have a video covering this and, uh, people should go check that out. But I'm, I'm curious, can you hook up any EV to this and get all like the system information or how does that work? Uh, also, are you planning on opening an EV service center or something? No, no, no EV service center uh, or anything like that. This is uh, just a scan tool. All tell sent over, you know, they sent us the DC fast charger. They're like, we also have other EV stuff. Do you want those? I'm like, yeah, let's send it. And so, yeah, it's basically oh. just you say that again, Dominic. Oh, uh, you, you just went to the robot for a moment there. Oh, sorry about that. It's Hopefully okay. I'm okay now. Yeah. Um, but yes, basically, uh, this is just a, a, a really, you know, professional grade EV scan tool. I can plug into directly a BMS. Uh, that's what the box you're looking at here. If I find a battery out of a car, if we remove a battery from a car, I'll be able to check the status of the battery, apply 12 volt, wake the BMS up, all that stuff. I have another box that has the big iPad looking thing in it. Uh, if you scroll to the end of this video, you'll see, um, you know, sort of that iPad later on in there and that's that's basically what we can you know view trouble codes with not unlike one of those twenty dollar scanners you can get at autozone this can just read all the proprietary manufacturer codes get into the locked systems like audi and mercedes and really get into the nitty-gritty of uh, all the cars we can look at state of health state of charge the individual cell voltages and the battery pack everything the car's got going on we can pretty much read with one of these and uh yeah thrilled thrilled to uh, be able to play around with it you don't need licenses from manufacturers to diagnose their cars though right nope okay i think autel takes care of all that it's in, you pay a subscription every year um uh, it's not cheap i mean this whole thing 7500 bucks plus 1600 dollars a year um, you know, Autel sent it to me and it at least has one year left on the subscription when I logged in. So I don't know. I haven't paid anything, uh, okay. but basically it, I can plug it in and I have plugged it into a bunch and I've diagnosed some issues with my Range Rover with it. I've diagnosed some issues with my Twizy. Um, we went through the e-tron, which had a bunch of trouble codes and, and, you know, none of them are, are bad or crazy. It's just, you know, they, you car store codes if hiccups happen. And you can at least see what the car went through previously. It's a great thing to do before you buy the car is plug this in. I wish I had it with me when I got the B-Class because then we right. could know the onboard charger wasn't the issue and it was something else, which I still would have bought the car. It wouldn't have changed anything. But uh, that was in Colorado when I was picking up the car in LA. So I just didn't have it with me. Yes. That was what I was just going to ask you. Why didn't you plug this into the B-Class? Because you, you wouldn't you would be able to tell Tony what's wrong with it. But, uh, uh, you know, Timing's everything. <laughs> right on. Um, all right. So uh, speaking of, so this is uh, going to be for updating and keeping your fleet up to up to spec, I guess, or out of spec. Spec. Yeah, we like the cars to stay in spec, but sometimes <laughs> they don't. Right. I want to so, plug it into the Coda and see what it says. Oh, it's true, right? I mean, yeah, you have a whole fleet of everything. I don't know how many cars you have right now. Like ten. I don't oh, know. Oh, double that. Ooh. Yeah, and is, you have this like is still, this is still the best one. Yeah, this is yeah, the, this, this is, yeah, by far. 
Twizy was pretty fun, I gotta say. Um, yeah, so speaking of fleets, uh, like much of the country north of me, uh, this week we've been, uh, you've been doing a winter tire swap on your fleet. Uh, so you are sponsored by Nokian and have access to uh, what many consider the best snow tire available today. But uh, anything you want to say about EV tires uh, for winter? It's just so important to have the the right tires in your car. This bit's not sponsored. I'm not this. It's just our out of spec reviews channel that they sponsor. Right. Yeah, and they don't have like, here. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, they should sponsor here because that'd be they, great. They, yeah, we um, need some sponsors. I just learned, not from Nokian actually, but from a viewer, that the factory winter tire now for Tesla in Norway is uh, Nokian. So that every Tesla is delivered on R5 or 10 EV studded, uh, which is great. So wow. yeah, love it. So basically, um, yeah, I'm a huge Nokia tire fan. I have been my whole life. It's cool to work with companies that I love personally because that's just like the perfect partnership. I would put their tires on my cars anyway, uh, and I have for years before they sponsored us. So it's just great to to have the right uh, you know c collaboration with them. And uh, yeah, so so all the cars are getting winters and everything. I have the Model S now on uh, Hakaplita R5 EV, which is again that factory Tesla tire in Norway. It's a great tire. I'm going to go actually because we have, I don't know, it's got to be four, five, six inches of snow fresh right now. The plows haven't been through. I'm going to take the Model Ooh. S out and see how it does. So that'll be fun. I That's went out a little timing. bit last night just to slide around and I was like, wow, this is kind of cool. And then on the e-tron, we went hardcore studded uh, winter tires because uh, we actually do get quite a bit of ice here and uh, slushy stuff that freezes. And even last night, it started to rain and then it froze. And then we had studded tires on the e-tron. So as cars are like sliding through intersections, it feels like we're just on pavement. I mean, I could do just full brakes and we stop. And so wow. just amazing. And so I'm a personal huge fan of studded tires. They don't work for everyone in every environment. So we only chose to go studded tires on the e-tron, the B-class, because it's two-wheel drive, and the Rivian. Those are the three that will have studded tires. Everything else will have non-studded uh, winter tires. And uh, yeah, all, all is great. Really love it. And including the Twizzy's got its own special tires too, right? The Twizzy has snow tires, yes. Because we actually took it to a, uh, we, we built with Nokian last winter, which was really cool, a snow course uh, driving uh, basically track at Copper Mountain. And right. uh, we built a racetrack in the snow. And so we had the Twizzy out there sliding around, which was really fun. Right on. Yeah, the and smart with the... cars on on winters. Oh, everything's ready to go. <laughs> awesome, perfect timing with the snow falling today. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, Tom. So last week we talked a little bit about the Shockflow EV uh, charger review that was you're going to have coming out, and now that's been posted. Uh, was there a bit more that you wanted to tell us about that charger? Yeah. So we talked a little bit about it last week, but now that the video is up. I figure we could talk, you know, a little bit more fully about what went on. Uh, you know, it, it's it's an interesting unit in, in that it passed all the the say torture tests that I do. I did a submersion test because it's IP67 rated. It didn't have any water intrusion. I did the extreme heat test, baked the thing up to like 165, 170 degrees. It continued charging. I did the deep freeze test on the cables. The cable actually performed pretty well for, for a, a cable that I, I didn't think had a really, really good rubberized jacket. It did well, and it got an extra point for that. I passed the, the connector drop test, even the unit drop test. When these small portable units, I dropped them also to see if I can get them to, to, to break with five drops. And uh, so it passed all the tests. But uh, it, it And actually, when the, we added the numbers up on my charger rater, which is just like a point-based system, uh, it doesn't really account for a lot of things. It's just one metric that I use when I when I when I rate them. It actually scored well, um, but uh, overall, I can't recommend it. Um, and for a couple of reasons, number one, it's not safety certified. That in itself can can lead me to say I can't recommend this item, even though the thing might seem well. It might seem to perform well. If it's not safety certified, we don't know what's going on inside. That's number one. Number two, so it has two cables. It has the the twenty foot cable that the connector is attached to, and it has a little fourteen inch uh, dongle that you plug into the NEMA fourteen fifty outlet. It comes with a NEMA fourteen fifty outlet. The cable that connects the 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 connector to the unit 
is nine gauge cable, which is very, it's strange. We don't use nine gauge here in, in the US. We go from 10 gauge down to eight gauge. And um, 10 gauge is insufficient for a 40 amp continuous draw. It's even insufficient for a 40 amp short term draw. So you have to use eight gauge wire. So when I saw this thing had nine gauge wire, which honestly I've never seen before on a charger, I looked up the specs and I, it's available in China. Very few places use it, but they do use it in China. And it would barely meet the NEC code for a 40 amp unit. So I said, okay, I'm not going to really criticize it much for the for, for the nine gauge cable. It, it's it's not what I would like to see, but it's barely, it's on that cusp. It, it, it would pass. But what I forgot to check, and this is on me, even, you know, the, the I make mistakes like everybody. I didn't check that 14 inch dongle because I assumed it was the same wire gauge as the long 20 foot cable. And I put the review out and immediately somebody sent me an email. And this is somebody that actually has one of these and said, look, Tom, I don't know if you noticed it, but that short cable is a 10 gauge wire. The long cable is nine gauge, but the short cable is 10 gauge, which is against code for a 40 amp draw. As a matter of fact, if you use it long enough, it will burn through the insulation and melt. Um, oh. So, so that 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 the uh, the 40 amp, the long cable is on the cusp. Okay, but that short cable isn't. A 10 gauge wire is only rated for 30 amps which means a continuous load, which chargers are continuous loads. Mm -hmm. has to, you have to derate it by 80%, by 20%. So, the, so by any C code, you should not use the shock flow to draw more than 24 amps. So it does have a setting that allows you to reduce the amperage from 40 amps to 32 amps. Even that's too much, down to 24 amps. Um, my recommendation is if anybody has one of these, um, particularly if you're charging it in, inside your home or somewhere. I know Kyle uses one when he's on the road at, at campsites or whatever. It's kind of a little bit of a different deal if it's outside. I mean, you still could have a problem with your vehicle. It could, still could cause some kind of spike and hurt your harm your car. But outside is a little bit different than inside your home. Do not set this for more than 24 amps. If you're using it inside your home, it simply is not rated for it. And if you go by NEC code, um, after I think four or five hours, the, the, the insulation around the wires will reach, I think it's 174, 175 degrees, a melting point for the insulation. So, um, it's just an unsafe unit. And that's part of why I'm such a, uh, um, you know, uh, I don't know what the right word is. I can't think of it right, right stickler. now, but stickler. I'm such a stickler for, for, for buying safety certified chargers. Because you just don't know what's going on inside. They seem like they're, they seem well, like this, even I use this for three weeks and I'm like, this is pretty good. You know, passed all my tests, charges, everything fine. Seems like it's well made. But unless you have a, a established body that, that scrutinizes every little connection on the inside, if it's welded, if it's, you know, uh, whatever, you don't know what's happening. And, you know, we all buy these great EVs that cost a lot of money. And then we want to cheap out when it comes to charging them. Um, you know, I'm still, you know, if, if, if you really need a portable charger, a portable EVSA, buy the J Plus Booster. The thing is rock solid. If, is it going to cost you a few hundred dollars more? Absolutely. You know, it's going to cost you as many as more than two of these. But you know what? That thing is durable. It's, 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 it, it's made super well. It's been tested. Um, you could, I drove over my, the one in, in my house with my lightning and my Rivian back to back eight, 6,600 pound vehicle, 8,000 pound vehicle back to back. And it didn't, it gave it a couple scratches, you know? So, um, please, you know, don't, don't try to, don't have a race to the, but yeah, there's the J plus booster. If you're watching us on, um, on YouTube, uh, it's it's just such a well-made uh, portable unit. If you need a good portable charger, buy one of these because I'm telling you, the more and more I test these budget chargers that we see on Amazon, uh, they're, they're almost all of them are just garbage and they're unsafe. So, um, you know, that's my advice. Um, the shock flow is, is not a recommended charger. I can't um, stress enough that it is unsafe and you could have a fire if you use it. 
I want to blow mine up now. I got to find a Hummer EV and just let that sucker ride for as long as possible. Ooh, oh my God. Uh, that's a great it... video. That's a great. That's... Absolutely. Well, great I let, if it really is going to catch on fire, let's catch it on fire. I guess. I, well, I, that, I, it's, a, it's a 10 gauge wire, Kyle, from the unit to the plug. And, you know, do some research online. Talk to like, you know, electrical engineers or whatever. And say, look, I want to I want to run 40 amps through a 10 gauge wire for eight continuous hours or with a Hummer. Geez, if you drive that thing down to nothing and you pull 40 amps, you could charge for more than a day. You know, yeah, that's what um, I'm going to uh, do. I'm going to find a yeah, really you know, warm day. I'm going to yeah. leave it in the sun and I'm going to let yeah. that sucker go. Yeah. So. And, you so, know, and, uh, and, 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 you know, it's very affordable. That's the, 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 the tough thing about this is the, uh, the temptation is they're super cheap. You know, right. it's $279 now, you know, the J plus booster costs twice that. Um, so people go online and they're like, Oh, and here's another thing that really bothered me about it. Like they talk a lot about safety and I hate this when these, when these um, vehicles do that, this, when, um, when these companies, talk all about safety. And you, you look at the Amazon ad and it talks safety, 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 safe charging. And then it says, um, it doesn't say safety certified, but it says uh, it's safety tested or something like that. And then it shows an FCC stamp next to it. And it looks like a, a safety certification stamp. Uh, and I bet mo most of the, I bet most of you guys, do, do you guys know what FCC stamp certifies? Uh, it's just for for communication. It doesn't interfere with uh, yeah, wavelength like, with radio. It means it's been tested signal. for the radio leakage, like radio right, wave yeah. leakage uh, from the right. unit. That's basically you know, which it has to be tested for that. Right. But the way Shockflow represents it on the website and on Amazon is they talk about safety certified, and then next to that they show the FCC stamp because most people would confuse that with like ETL or UL rating. So I hate when the companies even try to trick you. You know, they, they talk all about safety, but then it's not safety certified. So, you know, um, you know, I know I, I, I've, I've, I've gone down this road here before on, on the podcast and I'll continue to do it. Uh, just don't buy cheap charging equipment, please buy good quality safety certified equipment. It's going to cost you a few more dollars. Have your stuff installed by people that know what they're doing. It's the best decision you can make. You know, you got a car that costs 40, 50, 60,000 dollars. Now you're trying to save three hundred dollars on a charger and installation. Just you know, spend a little bit more, and you can sleep safely at night, knowing that there's not going to be a problem. Right on. Well, thank you for that, Tom. Um, let's move on to some news. Uh, but before we do, I just want, also wanted to thank. Uh, we have some people giving us some super thanks. So thank you very much, uh, Gary Bushy, and Jacob M Muirhead, and Robin Yateman. She looks familiar. I know who that is. Um, it's my sister. Uh, right. So thank you very much for that. That's wow, awesome. Amazing. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. That's great. Really, really do appreciate that. Uh, so travelers this weekend may have noticed, or travelers traveling in Tesla vehicles may have noticed uh, a change in their supercharging experience. That's because Tesla has replaced its idle fees with congestion fees at some places in an attempt to try to limit usage during the high times of, or during times of high volume. Uh, Tesla says a congestion fee is a fee you pay when a supercharger is busy and your vehicle's battery is above a certain level. It also adds that uh, congestion fees only apply when the supercharger is busy or your vehicle's battery is already at or above the congestion fee level. So previously at busy supercharger sites, uh, Tesla limited charging to 80%. And if you needed to go above that, you could just change the, the charging limit on your screen or on your app. Now, after you reach 90%, that's when the charging speeds really slow down, relatively speaking. So you will be charged a congestion fee of a $1 a minute to you know charge for as long as you're plugged in, you know, to get up to 100%. Um, so Tom, what are, what are your thoughts on this policy? Sound fair? Absolutely. Um, 100%. I'm surprised that they uh, only start charging at uh, 90%. I pro probably would have did it 85%. Um, you know, it's uh, when, when, when there's congestion, when the, when the site is filled, uh, you know, people should get off 
the, the charging slows down so much at 90 percent. Just unplug. And if, if you can't make your destination, there's plenty of superchargers. Stop at the next one, you know, all, all, along your route. You know, I, I, as Kyle uh, talks a lot about the fastest way to get from point A to point B is not hanging around at chargers when you're up over even up over 60 or 70 percent. So, you know, it's um, the, uh, I understand some people might be using these as like their home charger, like they can't charge at home. So they go to a supercharger once a week and they want to charge it to a, you know, a 100 percent. Right. And then so they don't have to go back for another four or five days or six days. But um, on on the, the, the superchargers that are, are congested, that there's people waiting get off at 80 percent, please and and uh let somebody else get some juice you just stop at another one or um come back at a time where you know there's not high uh, uh utilization of the site i'm totally fine with this right on kyle i imagine you have some thoughts about this as well because we've heard you talk about uh, uh other networks having people charged to 100 percent, and it can be frustrating right so um i think this works in certain locations. And I think Tesla would agree because it's not at every location. Right. Uh, David brings up a great point, which is if you are at a charger desert, if there is, you know, a, a need where you're towing or you have, you know, to go visit family and do a round trip and you do need the hundred percent, you still should have the ability to go to a hundred percent without penalty. Um, I don't actually think there's really an issue charging to a hundred percent on occasion when needed which I do on occasion when needed uh, in areas where there's limited charging coverage. And it sounds like this is not going to be implemented in areas with limited charging coverage. This sounds like it's going to be implemented in LA where there's a million superchargers and everyone charges to a hundred percent. And it's so frustrating. So um, the thing with Tesla is we don't get the exposure to how many drivers are full charging their vehicles because um uh we don't see their their state of charge displayed like we do at ea so when you roll up to an ea site i know there's going to be an id4 at 98 percent by the time i get there because i can see it on the screen and you know all of these things with tesla you have no idea if the guy next to you is right at the top or at the bottom the only indication would be a to look at their screen if you can peek into their car which i don't typically recommend doing or the little green light on the charge port will fat flash really fast if it's onboarding a lot of energy, if it's dead, and it will really slow down as they get close to 100%. So in areas, you know, I want to start with the negatives here. It sounds like it's only going to be implemented at sites where there is a congestion issue, where there's plenty of uh, other chargers in every direction that you could go to as your next stop. With that in mind, I love this idea, and I would actually start at 80% charging. I think this is um, you know, what we've been needing to encourage better user behavior. Francie actually did a great podcast on this yesterday on the Out of Spec podcast. I agreed with her uh, 100% on what she said, which is basically – you know, you need to drive consumer behavior somehow and battery longevity isn't necessarily it and a few other things. So, um, you know, it's, it's cost, <laughs> it's, you know, right. you start charging a dollar a minute, you're good to go. The, the big uh, question mark is, is this a fair way to do it? Uh, is it a dollar a minute? Is that the fair way? Because every Tesla charges differently above 90%. So in essence, it's going to cost someone who bought a brand new model three LFP, a lot less money to get to a hundred percent than someone that bought the previous generation, perhaps used, uh, you know, model S 85, that might take a whole 30 to 40 minutes or even an hour to complete at a hundred percent from 90. And so is the dollar per minute thing fair? Should they raise the price per kilowatt hour, uh, to, you know, 50% higher or a hundred percent? I'm not sure because ultimately people will need to charge to hundred percent or at least feel like they need to in certain cases. And also LFP battery packs from Tesla require a 100% charge once a week. And right. if this is your main charging location. Now it's going to cost you an extra, we can do the math and maybe even a video on it. It might cost you an extra you know, $50 a month to full charge that thing once a week. Uh, right. And so, you know, we don't know exactly how this is all going to play out. My feeling, I would rather see a higher kilowatt hour price rather than a per minute fee imposed. Um, but that's just me. Uh, either way, I think this is going to encourage better user behavior at chargers. 
Right. And th this will be on top of the, the whatever you're paying per kilowatt hour as well. I couldn't find actually, you know, in the, in the facts, there's, they have a great fact on the Tesla website that uh, talks about this uh, change, but they don't say that the explicitly that the one, $1 a, a minute charge is on top of the uh, per kilowatt hour charge, but I believe it is. Yeah, yeah it has to be because, um, you know, ultimately this is a, a fee. This is a punishment. <laughs> this is, right. a, you know, you're doing something wrong and we're charging you for it uh, on top of the energy that you're taking in. So should uh, some of these CCS networks follow suit and do a similar type of thing? I think I think it's really difficult. You know, my my initial reaction is just build enough chargers to to support everyone in right. whatever kind of behavior you need. But however, that is just so expensive. So there are certain sites, and um, you know, actually, what I would do rather than maybe the networks imposing a limitation, which which I'm still not necessarily against, but what I would really love to see is some of these automaker partnerships like Volkswagen with EA say you get all the charging you want up to eighty percent for free. Anything yeah. above 80%, you pay for. It's going to increase their warranty costs for everyone charging to 100% on DC all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it clogs up the stations. And it would just be better for everyone. And then if someone needs to go to 100% for the road trip, they just pay that difference. And so I think that's honestly the best initial way to, to do this. Um, what do you think, Martin? Would this work in Europe? Uh, there's a few cars floating around with free supercharging, so the congestion fee doesn't apply at 90% for those cars. So if you are absolutely hell bent on going Is to 100%, that true? it doesn't like idle fees apply. Idle, idle, fees, idle I, fees apply from 100% with free supercharging, but if you are grandfathered supercharging, you can go, you can run past 90 and get to 100 till you get charged. So wow. if you are hell bent on that, then go get yourself a grandfathered free supercharging um tesla uh i don't know how many of those are still around i know that the tesla are incentivizing people to get out of those giving you incentives to get into your next tesla and and getting them back into to tesla stock and then, then switching off that feature so um yeah would it work um yes uh, i don't think it's as urgent over here because i still never see queues at superchargers not saying it doesn't happen i don't do a lot of road tripping um but when i'm out and about i see lots of people sharing on a and b units um but i don't see a queuing system like you guys like a lot of our viewers in the us over holiday season are going to experience so not sure it's needed here yet i imagine it will be one day um but for now i, I think the main thing is is that is as, as francie says you have to nudge people's behavior in the right direction and you still get a lot of people who don't know about charge curves don't know about tapering and then you get the people who do know about it but don't don't want, care <laughs> don't want to be part of you know getting on as as with 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 your friends and neighbors in the ev community or just just being a good human being so uh and, and actually that's fair they've got a car they're gonna go to 100 percent. screw you uh if that's that, that's what they want to do that's what they want to do so i think it's good that it moves people's behavior towards understanding once you're at 80 percent, 90 percent, your car charges differently um yeah i mean you you don't get it at petrol pumps where uh it comes to the top of the auto sensor you've got the handle pulled and and then the pump cuts out and then you know you don't see people taking it out just a little bit and squeezing a bit more in take it out squeeze it well some people might i don't know but it's analogous to that just move on get out of the way yeah all right so let's move on a little bit so this week Elon Musk announced that Tesla is open sourcing its Tesla Roadster service information. I thought we just mentioned this since we were on Tesla anyway, and this was kind of related. So, uh, so yeah, so Tesla has opened up its all its information about technical information details about the uh, Tesla Roadster now. So, Kyle, are you tempted to buy one, an original Roadster, now that all this information is available and you have that fancy diagnostic tool? Well, well, I've been tempted to buy one since before any of this was available. <laughs> I, I really want a Roadster. I've always wanted one, but the pricing is just going into the stratosphere for what you really get. Right. Uh, and so, you know, I think maybe I should find uh, a crashed one and do a thing with, you know, Gruber, mm -hmm. one of these service companies, something like, I don't know. Uh, it's it's a car that's definitely on the list. I'd love to own one day, but it's it's ultimately like not a good car. Like they have really bad thermal limitations and all these things, but it's a really cool car. And I've right. had the chance to drive three or four of them over the years. And 
and All really right. do some miles in them. So I, I'm pretty familiar with it, and it's just so much fun. Um, but you just have all these little issues. It's really temperamental. You really got to stay on top of maintenance, which I don't mind all these things. Um, you got to, you know, service your PEM every year, all these things. But um, now that it's all available, I'm, I'm just so glad Tesla did this pretty cool. And um, yeah, props to them for for releasing everything. I know two people with an original Roadster, and I have a theory about why they're open sourcing the details on this vehicle and actually one of the guys uh, lives, uh he lives across the park from me he's like a five minute walk um he does garage the roadster but he does daily drive the roadster uh because he believes life is for living um right. and i think he bought it when it was in the tens of thousands and and nobody wanted one and they weren't very fashionable um and now uh i said to him you know this is well into six figures now he, and he's like yeah this is cool this is my pension i'll sell it one day but um until then i'm driving it to the shops and he's I mean, he, <laughs> bigger set of kahunas than me. I'd have that thing under, you know, under a blanket. I'd check on it every night. Are you okay under there? Yeah. <laughs> Owning an asset worth that much money, but wow. Um, so, but I've asked both of those. There is a point to my story. I've asked both of my friends with original roadsters. You guys must be like, you know, people who, who frequently fly. Um, I have friends that frequently fly. They, they have a different phone number to call at the airlines. And when they call that number, the people at the airlines go, Oh, no, we have a couple of spare seats in first. We'll put you in that one. I said, you must have like a hotline to Tesla. You must call up and be like, I'm one of 20 people in the UK with a right-hand drive Tesla Roadster. Then there must be fireworks that go off when you go there. And both of, said, both of them have said to me, Tesla want nothing to do with me. I can't get a response. I can't get any information. If they call up for a service center to say I have an original Roadster, we have a question. Um, they said, we rely 100% on the community and the community that is um, robust and supports each other, but Tesla want nothing to do with those original roadsters. They won't take the call. And I was amazed because those these people are, there must be 20 or 30 people in this country. Come on, just roll out the red carpet and let's celebrate these people for keeping these vehicles on the road. So my theory is that by... Because you know, I you know, I if I can find criticism in Elon Musk, I always will. <laughs> Sorry, Tesla fans. My theory is they're open sourcing all of this to wash their hands of it. That's so my they, impression as well, Martin. I and and I'm not as critical as yeah. you are, but that's my impression. <laughs> Be, because um, there was a period of time where Tesla was trying to buy back Roadsters, like Ooh. trade them in big, and they would just dismantle them and leave them there. Like they just didn't even want them going back on the roads. Right. So that's it. That's rumor. That's what I was told from from some Roadster guys is like, don't trade in your Roadster to Tesla because they will dismantle it and not let it back on the roads. Right. Well, that was for parts, right, Kyle? Weren't they doing that? So they had parts. I don't think you because can. Legally, I, I, just, I, don't I don't think, don't think I can do can that. Sell a used part. Yeah. No, no. Okay, I, mean, I, guess not. I mean, well, you never know. <laughs> because I had heard that they were doing that also buying them and dismantling them. And I assumed it was because they needed parts. Yeah, right. maybe for some internal stuff, but I don't I don't think they ever sold a used yeah. part as new or anything like not that I've heard. Right, of. That we know but that it, we know about. Yeah, yeah. I mean there's there's people that are way more versed in the roadster space than we are, but but ultimately they're cool cars. Love this move, mm -hmm. but Martin, I totally agree. Tesla doesn't want to deal with this anymore. They don't have to. I think they have a 10-year legal obligation from when the car stops production to retain some sort of support for it. There's some law that says they have to support it for a certain period of time. Maybe that time's up and they're like, see you later. Right. But the Tesla, I mean, the Roadster is an important car just in the history of uh, electric vehicles. I, I feel like it's really the, the the car that, you know, woke up the auto, the, the other automakers and said, oh, this is actually possible to put, a, you know, make a car, electric car that goes over 200 miles. So that this now actually has some utility. Uh, right. So I think it's the Roadster is really the, the car that, you know, brought, brought on this uh, revolu evolution. I think Tesla will, I think they will get there in as the company evolves. I was watching a um, uh, Marquez Brownlee uh, video, uh, an MKBHD video of he bought an original iPhone and it was in its packaging and uh, he did it for his channel. So obviously it made him the money uh, and he paid lots and many, I think many tens of thousands of dollars for this original iPhone recently. And he did the cutting open of the plastic and getting it out. And it, I think it booted up as well. Um, original iPhone, no apps, just the original one. Um, and I think Apple's in that place now where they don't have to carry on looking at the next thing. They can celebrate their history 
Mm -hmm. um, and I think Tesla will get to that. Maybe it'll be a point when Elon Musk moves on to whatever it is, just social media and rockets and stuff. And there's there's more of a Tim Cookie type CEO, COO running Tesla, which is, will happen one day. Elon can't be there forever. And I think at that point, Tesla will evolve as they become bigger and they're making two, three, four, five million cars a year where they might put an, an original Roadster on display when you go into the, you know, the Texas Gigafactory and you walk into the reception. They'll have one hanging or they'll have one on a podium. They're not there yet. Tesla are still looking at the next big thing. They're still trying to behave like a scrappy company at times of like, hey, we're the underdog. And, and they're in this awkward teenager phase with spots on their face because they're not the scrappy underdog anymore. But they, there's a lot of mileage still in being seen as the underdog and... Uh, and not being one of the establishment old boys uh, from Detroit. So I think that that will happen over time. And then I think they'll embrace their past because the Roadster is so important to the move to e-mobility that it, we shouldn't just forget about that vehicle. It was it was so important. It was pivotal. Right. It's kind of funny. There was a few different sports cars at that time that didn't quite make it. You know, in the UK, you had the Lightning Project, Lightning GT. This is an awesome looking car with the in-wheel motors. Um, and, and in uh, Monaco, we had... Um, Oh shoot! His name's escaping me. He was involved with Formula E. For, I think he's actually, you know, they have a Formula E team still, but they're not producing cars like they were going to be a, a you know a small automaker, and they, they've sort of backed away from that. But um, yeah, oh man, it's driving me nuts. Uh, anyway, let's move on real quick. So Ford has had a bit of a good news, bad news kind of week. So uh, let's start with the bad. First off, Ford has decided to cut back on its LF. P battery plant in Marshall, Michigan. So instead of a 35 gigawatt hour output, it's looking like uh, 20 gigawatt hours. So not half, but close. Uh, now, construction of the plant was shut down two months ago during the recent uh, UWA strike. The new plan allows the company to reduce the number of workers by 32%. And investment for the plant itself has been cut from 3.5 to 2.2 billion. So that's a huge cut there. According to uh, Ford's chief communications officer, Mark Truby, slower than expected demand for electric vehicles was the primary factor in Ford's decision to downsize the Marshall project. Um, he added that if demand grows, the plant could increase in size again. So this this pullback is in addition to uh, the decision several weeks ago to delay production of uh, one of the two Blue Oval SK battery plants in Kentucky as well, also because they say of lower than expected demand. So Martin, we're going to look at some sales numbers in a bit, but what's your gut tell you about this decision, this, especially the LFP? It, this makes sense as part of the move that the established car companies have to do to electric vehicles. If they got it right first off the bat, we'd all be amazed. And there's a few false starts. There's a little bit two steps forward, one step back. There's a little bit of, oh, to you, to me, are we getting the right, you know, oh, let's scale this up a bit. Let's scale it back a bit. And I understand over the last couple of years, I said this on a recent podcast um, and I quite liked it. So, so I'll say it again. I think the last few years of the EV revolution has been driven by the CTO in the boardroom saying we must do this. We must have batteries and factories. And, and the board went along. I think we're in a period where the CFO is in charge and they're saying, well, hang on a minute. We need to make sure we do this affordably and things are being pulled back and it's going to find an equilibrium. So this is this is all very natural. There's obviously places that will report this as scaling things back and, and reducing, but it's just finding the right balance of how many cars you make, how many batteries you make, what your investment is over the next 10 years. No one knows the answer. And let's give some of these big car companies a break at how harsh we are on them because they're just trying to get it right. Okay. That's so, so reasonable sounding, man. That's <laughs> Sorry <sick>. about that. <laughs> 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 Makes for a terrible podcast if we don't say something ridiculous. Right. Well, we can talk about Toyota a little bit later. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying that word till next year. I told you. <laughs> That's right. Um, so I want to move on because we'll, we'll get back to this in a second. Um, but I also want to mention that. Uh, do, do, do. Oh, yeah. So Ford is also easing up on its EV dealer requirements. This is a bit more neutral. I'm not sure if it's good news or bad news, but I thought it was worth mentioning that uh, it's reducing training costs by half and lowering the number of chargers that uh, dealers need to install and also delaying that installation deadline by six months. So uh, some initial enrollment. Since initial enrollment began a year ago, almost 400 dealers have dropped out of the program, which is a lot. 
Ford has about 3,000 dealers altogether in the U.S. So previously, top-tier dealers, the certified elite, they call them, they had to install five AC chargers. That's been reduced to three. And the requirement to add a DC fast charger by 2026 has been removed. Uh, the lower tier of dealers were, were required also to uh, install start to install five and that's been changed to two. So Tom, you've worked extensively with dealers. Uh, do you have some quick thoughts about this? Yeah. So I was actually at the uh, meeting when Ford broke the news to the dealers, to their dealer lobby. I was one of, I think they only invited about six journalists. Right. Um, and it was an, in, it was kind of like an internal meeting. It was their annual dealership, like powwow when Ford gets together with the dealers and I was sitting at the table when Farley and the, the Ford staff told the dealers this is what they were going to be doing. And uh, it was interesting because I got to talk to a lot of the dealers. And these weren't just small dealers. The dealerships that come to these meetings are big time dealers. Some of them own like, you know, 24 dealerships and the, the representatives of the dealer union were there and everything. And, you know, they were flabbergasted with the how strict the uh the uh requirements were going to be and i knew at the time and i i'm, I'm sure ford knew that that this was going to be an uphill battle you know it wasn't that okay these are going to be the rules and that's it take it or leave it ford's being sued from every corner of the country right now over these rules they're being sued in like every state wow. um you know e you know even the states that are more um, let's say supportive of electric vehicles. New York State sued the the New York State dealer lobby. I think sued sued uh, sued Ford. So I, I think they're they're kind of at this point realizing that you know that they that I'm not saying at this point realizing they realized all along, but they didn't know how strong the pushback was going to be. It's severe, and to the point where the dealers, as you said, are dropping out of the program. I think in a in a in a, in a sign of solidarity. To Say, look, if we all drop out, they 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 have to completely eliminate these the these restrictions. And and ultimately, you know, the biggest thing about this whole all the restrictions aren't even the infrastructure. That's the that's not even the big point here. What what Ford was really doing was a Trojan horse for set pricing, and 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 the, this whole Model E dealership uh, certified and certified elite. Uh, thing where you had to lock in set pricing and put it at the Ford dealership. The the dealers looked at it as well. You know, many of the dealers looked at it as well. EV sales are such a small percentage of our sales. You know, it doesn't really matter if we if we lock in set pricing. But Ford realized that as the years progress, five years, eight years, 10 years, 15 years from now, th there might be 90% EV sales. And, and they would have built this... Trojan horse, and now the dealers are locked into set pricing on 90% of their vehicles. So that's the big fight here, is that the dealerships don't want to lose control over set pricing. And that's why so many of them are fighting forward and saying, we're, we're going to drop out of this. We want no part of this, because they know the long-term implications are going to be their ability to charge what they want is going to be removed. From, from them. And that's something that the dealers are holding on very, very tightly to. So all this motion now about, well, you have to stall three instead of five, that's dressing. That's not yeah. the main core issue here. Um, and that doesn't bother me at all. It's just, I, I knew, you know, when I when, when Ford announced this, I was flabbergasted at the meeting. I was like, you, you're never going to get away with this. I know I work with dealer lobbies in in tons of states, and I know how strong they're connected with local politics and judges, and, and they, they're the ones that put judges in their seats, and they're the ones that the judges are going to be the ultimate ones that decide whether or not this is fair and is going to be, you know, upheld. And they're already starting to see, you know, these cases go to court, and the judges are going to side on the side of uh, of, of of the dealer lobbies. They did it in what was it, Indiana? It just came through this week. I've been I've been on vacation. So um, was it Indiana? One of the states ruled that um, they threw it out. Like Ford can't can't enforce this whole the whole thing, the whole Model E structure where they wow. they make the dealers do all this. It's thrown out of the state. Florida either did it or is close to doing it. So Man. I think Ford's realizing that you know, hey, it was a good try. 
now let's figure out what can we salvage from this? What can we keep intact? We'll give the dealers back. Um, it was Illinois. Thanks, uh, Cicero. Um, and uh, we'll give the dealers back s some of, of the things we were asking for. I, I don't think Ford ever thought that they were going to get 100 percent of what they were. The rules were going to be. I think it was a negotiation. They, they hit the dealers hard. said you're going to spend a million five on infrastructure. You're going to you're going to you're going to have training, continuous training. You're going to lock in set pricing. You're going to do the They they, they threw them a of things, knowing that when the dust settled in two or three years, they, they'd be lucky if they got half of what they were asking for. And I think that's it's still at that point where we don't know where this is going to end. I right. don't think we've heard the last of Ford making concessions to this because it's it it was an incredibly bold move that Ford did with this. And, and if they weren't got away with it, it would it would, you know, revolutionize the way we sell cars in the U.S. Well, so the dealers are saying, uh, I was just trying to think how this is going to work out for them on, on the lots. And they're saying they're not really having an issue with not having enough AC charging. They're able to, you know, with one or two AC chargers, keep whatever electric demonstrators they have charged up fully. Does that seem like a, uh, well, you know, does that seem well, like. Well, yeah, that, that might seem fine in 2024. Okay. Right, yeah, right. You know, or 2023 we're still in. Right. But Ford was going forward looking and saying all this infrastructure had to be put in. Because, you know, in three, four, five years, 2027, 20, 28, when, you know, you know, not 2% of your car sales, maybe 20% of your car sales are electric, that the, you're, you're going to need it then. Yeah. And the fact that they wanted every all the dealers to install at least one public facing DC fast charger was really not that we think that dealerships are the best place to have DC fast charging. It mm -hmm. was just a matter of the fact that I think I forget they said something like 86 percent of all Americans live within 20 miles of a Ford dealership, something like that. Some crazy number like that. And it, you can imagine if every Ford dealership had a working DC fast charger that was public facing, not that it would be like, you know, Tesla Supercharger Network or Electrify America or whatever, but it would add to the fact that people knew at least if worse came to worse, I'm in an area that doesn't have chargers, I could find a local Ford dealership and charge there. It was just kind of like a safety net. It wasn't right. supposed to be this coast to coast network. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think it's unfortunate that that part of the puzzle is getting carved out, but it doesn't surprise me because I've, I've worked with the dealer unions in like eight different States now, and they rule with an iron fist. They control how cars are sold in the U S people don't realize how powerful the dealership unions are. Right. Um, so let's let's talk about uh, the numbers real quick. We, we got to go really soon, but I just wanted to mention uh, you you brought this up last night, actually, in, in our chat. Um, the, Lightning, the good news that Ford had this week is that the F-150 Lightning has hit a sales record in October. So year over year, they're up 52% to 3,712 3, units. So sales have fluctuated quite a bit this year with sales over the summer months and September being significantly down. I think they were down 46% year over year, like the third quarter uh, Ford sales, 48, 45.8, I guess, percent, um, which is a huge. So it's kind of after that big, you know, uh, depression in sales, you know, they come roaring back. Like this is these are big numbers in compared. I don't know if you can see the chart on the Inside EVs uh, article about this, uh, Martin, but you can that kind of shows you vis visually like the how it's been over the summertime, and then boom, October, everything's huge. I mean, this is after they've made these decisions, uh, these decisions to cut back, you know, the battery production here and there. So I'm just kind of wondering now, maybe like this summer, after seeing these numbers, they just got cold feet and cut back and then maybe they're regretting it or, or maybe they will regret it if if the numbers continue on november and in december because it overall it looks like we're going to match for the year total we're, we're going to come pretty close to matching last year's total i think it's like uh I, I need to check before i say that number but yeah any any thoughts on that kyle i didn't follow your logic i'm sorry oh i'm just, okay so They've had a record month in October. Yes. If you, so if you look at, at the chart we're looking at on the screen, so that red line is like October's the farthest one to the right. 
is yes. you know October sales like far and above all the red lines preceding it, the, the four months preceding all the whole year obviously but uh, so it was during those like August or July September I think that maybe the uh, decision was made to cut back production because it looked like sales were kind of tanking a bit compared to the the, the year previous. So I'm thinking, did they get cold feet too soon? Because like, if October sales continue on like this, I see what you're saying. Nope. Right. I think uh, their projections look far deeper into the future at a larger economic profile of what we might go through or might have avoided. I'm not sure, and so uh, I, I don't think they're making these short-sighted uh, changes based on a couple months of because we've had some instability in our economy that we hope that we won't have forever. Right. And um, yeah, I, I don't think this these these dips really play into it. Also, I think, um, you know, like I said previously, with the cash on the hood tax credit incentive coming in January, I personally know many people waiting until January 1 to get their card. Okay. That's going to be interesting to see, uh, thing to see then, what, what happens to these kind of numbers. Uh, yeah. I think but, interest rates also played in, Dom. Um, with the interest rates continuing to rise or expensive vehicles. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why we saw a little bit of a, of a lull with electric vehicle sales in general, I think mm -hmm. in this country, there's, you know, the sky isn't falling. Uh, there's a little bit of a slump for a few months. Uh, and there's a, there's a number of reasons that contributed to that, but in the end, we're going to sell, we're going to have more EV sold this year than last year, you know, and every year we keep having more. So, it's not like we're going backwards. You know, right. there, there was a couple of soft months. Uh, hopefully yeah. that's going to be corrected now. It seems like it has been for the lightning. We'll see in November. But, um, you know, the, the it seemed like every news outlet was reporting how EVs were, you know, the, the, it, was, it was the end. You know, we had a couple of months. They're piling up on lots. Can't get rid of these things. Nobody wants them. <laughs> you know, no, uh, the, yeah. the, 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 there's nothing could be further from the truth. We had a couple soft months with EV sales, the hundred percent, but um, right. that's going to correct itself. And, um, you know, we're, we're still going to, we're on a record pace. I think we've sold a million EVs in the U S already. Um, as of now, or within the next day or two, we're going to hit a million for, for 2023. Um, nice. Which I believe that's the earliest we ever hit like a million vehicles in the, in a model year. Nice. So speaking about that real quick, um, I was thinking like the Ford uh, Mach-E numbers were kind of soft too, but I looked at their actual numbers and they're not actually not bad. The thing's selling like way more than I expected. So anyway, I just thought I'd mention those things, but uh, we should probably get going. We're over time. I know Martin has places to go and podcasts to F F1 races to... Shocking. I'm going to go talk about cars burning fuel, racing around in circles. Please don't burn me with pitchforks. Now, we always need that. That's Thank good. You. That's good part of our human yes. culture. And that's that's that is the I made a video this week, uh, last week about uh, one of the uh, Nordic uh, racing series going electric as well. And I was watching the videos. I was watching all the B-roll and stuff. And again, uh, don't lynch me. Uh, not uh, don't lynch me with pitchforks. That's what I was meant to say. Um, but I, I, comparing it to the previous series that had these, I don't know, stupid little V6s that would just like little flies blatting over jumps and stuff. The electric ones sound terrible. And okay. um, and that video's had like two and a half thousand views and no one cares. And I and sorry, but we don't have to get rid of every last drop of oil that we get out of the ground. Um, we can go burn stuff in places as long as we're sensible about stuff. So yeah. And if you're going to burn stuff, at least have fun with it. Like oh, make it in something yes. exciting. Don't burn yeah. it in some four cylinder SUV commuting to work, you yeah, know, burn absolutely. it in a rally car. <laughs> yeah. Formula one's getting itself tied up in so many circles about going to net zero. And that's true. Cause they fly around the world to 20 plus races a year. Yeah. And I understand. Cool. I understand all that. Um, and I, I talk about it on the weekly podcast each week. Um, but in terms of what they're going to do with things like e-fuels and more batteries and stuff like that, I think that's the wrong direction. I think just give me a loud V10 that hurts my ears when it goes past, uh, that makes my ears bleed, um, and do that for two hours on a Sunday afternoon. And then I'll go and drive my electric car home. So there we go. Uh, all right. Don't hate me. Don't hate me. It's all right. 
So I guess that brings us to the end of our show. Uh, enjoy the rest of your vacation there in, in Thailand, Tom. I'm not sure if you're joining us next week or not, but uh, we can talk about that after. Um, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please leave them below or get in touch with us on the social media platform of your choice. Uh, don't forget, if you like the show, uh, please give us a thumbs up, click subscribe, tap that bell icon for notifications. Thank you all very much for joining us. I hope you have a great, wonderful Thanksgiving weekend. Um, and we'll see you all again next time. Ciao.